Good to see everybody here with us. Singers, if you will, go ahead and come on up. Ushers, if you will, make your way down as we'll take up this morning's offering. How many folks are glad to be in God's house today? Amen. Good to see everybody. And we're going to go to the Lord in prayer. Do we need to stay standing? Everybody stay standing as we sing this song, first song together. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to be here and gather just like we are today. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would just be welcome here in this place. I pray that you would move pew to pew, heart to heart, be with the music, be with the reading of your word. And God, we just praise you for Jesus Christ. And that's who we are here to worship today. Thankful that he is not dead, but he is very much alive. And so I thank you, uh, God, for being with us. And so bless this offering, bless our time, and we ask that in Jesus' name, amen. Stay standing, let's sing. We're going to sing of the goodness of God. gonna sing regardless if we have music we can sing in acapella Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. When my life played down, I surrendered now, I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. 
been good to you this week? Amen. He sure has. He sure has. Now we're going to sing what a day that will be. There is coming a day when no heartache shall come. No more clouds in the sky. No more tears to dim the all is peace forevermore on that happy golden shore. What a day, glorious day that will be. What a day. seated.
I'll tell you what, hey, hey, uh, uh, Sherry. Mother. Singers. Come back up here a minute. I learned a long time ago it's best to do what God says to do. Life's a lot easier when you do what Jesus would have us do. Anybody else ever experienced that? Or am I the only one here today? Okay. So, the last song we sang talks about going to a place where there'll be no more heartache, pain, sorrow. What I know is that there are people here today who are carrying heartache, pain, and you're full of sorrow. Cool thing is, as Christians, it's temporary. This life, this body that you are in is temporary. Thank God we get to go to a better place, and that's heaven. But we're going to sing this song again. We're going to open up the altar, which is always open. And if you've got heartache, sorrow, and pain, don't sit where you are. I want you to come down here. And let's pray, okay? Because this song reminds us of what's to come. Jesus said, cast everything over on me. I'm telling you right now, Jesus' shoulders are broad. There's nothing going on in your life that he cannot help you with. So this time when we stand and we sing, don't act tired. Just stand up and let's sing and you're full of sorrow, pain and hurt. Find you a place right here. Jesus is saying, come Cast everything over, all right? Who needs to come? Don't even hesitate. Don't even wait till they start singing. Find you a place in the altar. There is coming a day when no heartache shall come. No more clouds. tears to dim the eye. All is peace forevermore on that happy golden shore. What a day shall see and I look upon his face the one who saved me by his grace when he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land what a day be no sorrow there, no more burdens to bear, no more sickness, no pain, no more parting over there, and forever. day, glorious day that will be. What a day that will be when my Jesus 
yes, I shall see. And I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. When he takes me by the hand and leads me through the promised land, what a day. day that will be when my Jesus I shall see and I look upon his face the one who saved me by his grace when he takes me by the hand and be seated. <clears throat> Anybody need to testify about his goodness? Anybody? Now's a good time to do it. Yeah. Man. Anybody else? Man. Amen. Any others? Amen. 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 Absolutely free. Amen. Never leaving us nor forsaking us is not just for right here. It's all the way through. Matthew chapter 5. Matthew 5. Continuing our study of the Beatitudes from the Sermon on the Mount. And this is week number three together talking about the Beatitudes. Now, what I'd like to do is start reading in verse number one. I'll read down through verse five. 
our beatitude today is found in verse number five. Okay? Just a reminder, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount was given to those who were following after him, his disciples and some others, and they sat down. Jesus sat down not because he was tired. He sat down because he was and is a man of of authority. And during this time in culture, the teacher would sit and those who were being taught would stand. And so we see in verse number one that he looks at the crowds and the Bible says he went up on the mountain and when he had sat down, his disciples came to him. So when they see Jesus sit down, I believe they thought he's about to teach us something. Something is about to be taught here. What I don't think they realized is what they were about to be taught was revolutionary in its teaching. You might want to write this down on your sheet of paper this morning. This is uh, with what we're discussing here in the Beatitudes, but it's something that holds true throughout the life of Jesus is that everything he did while he was on earth was counter his culture. He lived counterculture. I want to say right now in America, you as a Christ follower are called to live counter your culture. You're called to stand out for Jesus Christ, not to blend in. And Everything he did was that, and we certainly see that here with the Sermon on the Mount and the Beatitudes, all right? So they come to him in verse 2, and he opened his mouth, and he taught them, saying, we've always said any time in Scripture when you see the words of Christ are in red, if you have a red letter edition, when Jesus speaks, we ought to listen. We need to really tune in. And here is Jesus. This is what we've already learned about. Number one, the first one are the blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn. This is number two, last time we were together. For they shall be comforted. And here's our beatitude for today. Number three, verse five, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Let's pray. God, help us today as we look at this uh, sermon from Jesus that was delivered so long ago, but is so relevant today. Open up our hearts and our minds to receive the message that you have for every single one of us. And We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. So I want you to go ahead right now, take a pen, pencil, highlighter, something that you have to mark with. And at verse number five, I want you to circle the word meek. It's the key word with our beatitude number three today. Blessed are the meek. Well, what in the world does the word meek mean? It means gentle. It means to be mild in nature. I want to remind you also that when we study the Beatitudes, Beatitudes, it's speaking of our attitude as Christians. And it's easy in life with different circumstances that come our way for our attitudes to be anything uh, Less than perfect, right? How many's ever had a bad attitude? That's everybody. Should raise your hand up in the air. At some point in an, of another, you have had a bad attitude about something. Uh, but as Christ followers, it's with Jesus' help. In adverse situations, we can have the attitudes that we're learning about here. Uh, in the beatitude portion of the Sermon on the Mount. 
And just as the last beatitude we talked about, the beatitude we're talking about this morning, it's not probably what you think it means on surface level. Last time we were together, we talked about blessed are those who mourn. And that passage, we said, is taken out of context a lot. It's, it's used at funerals or when someone uh, is really suffering and going through a hardship. But remember, that's actually speaking to our sin. And we ask the question, when is the last time that we have been broken over our sin? And so when we look at these Beatitudes, they are very deep, all right? Jesus is not surface level with his disciples here. And what I mean by that is he's diving deep and he's hitting them in the heart, all right? That should be what we want. When we come to church, we should want to be hit right in the heart, okay? We should want our toes to be stepped on, all right? <laughs> no pain, no gain. It's what I said as we hiked the other day. No pain, no gain. Somebody said, we don't need, it was one of them young boys. They said, we don't need that bear spray. Pastor Josh is so slow, it'll eat him anyway first. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> That's what I said. <laughs> he wasn't lying, though. Whew. But we think about these Beatitudes, and we, I mentioned our culture a couple of times. Our culture teaches us this. Here's what America and the culture we live in teaches us. Blessed are the successful, the powerful, and the beautiful. That's what's going on right now. Uh, but when we think about meekness, you probably already have thought, okay, meekness I'm going to have to be weak. Well, let's go ahead and dispel that myth and fill this in on your sheet of paper that you got. Meekness is not weakness. All right? You've got to understand that when we study this beatitude. Now, there are two examples in the Bible of servant leadership. A great one that you can study is Moses. Moses was one of the great servant leaders leaders in the Old Testament. There's many others, but Moses is one who we know well. He could not speak very eloquently. And the reason I bring Moses into this is because he is a great servant leader, and it shows us that whatever excuse we try to make with God, God says, I can take you as you are, and do mighty things. Moses told God when God found him on the backside of the desert. You may be here today and say, I tell you what, God doesn't see me, preacher. If he can find Moses on the backside of the desert, let me interpret that for you, the middle of absolutely nowhere. God sees you exactly where you are. But Moses is found, burning bush is happening, the bush is not being consumed, and he stops to take a look at it, and it's God. And he says, I want you to go to Pharaoh. And if you remember, you remember, you probably know the story. He says, I can't talk good. God said, done figured that out. Aaron's going to go with you, and he's going to do the talking, but I'm going to talk to you first, and you're going to tell Aaron what to say. Was Moses a servant leader? He sure was because he led almost, we feel like, two million people that whined and complained the whole way. And every single time that they didn't think God was going to come through, God came through. Servant leader. But you know who the greatest servant leader in the Bible is? Say it louder, Shannon, for those in the back. Louder, they can't hear you. 
Jesus. Turn to Philippians. Hold your place in Matthew. You've got to show you this. <clears throat> you cannot talk about being meek without talking about Jesus. Can't do it. Impossible. Sorry, not sorry. We're turning. And here's the cool thing. You know, Jesus doesn't need me, but he wants me. Did you hear what I just said? Jesus does not need me, but he wants me. And you know how often we get in our little minds this, this uh, false narrative of, well, I'm the only one doing anything for God. Can I give you some bad English? All you teachers, hold your ears. No, you ain't. There's a lot of people doing things for Jesus. Remember, Elijah got in that situation too. Elijah, it's interesting to me. He, he defeats 850 prophets of Baal, and then he takes off running in the next chapter because of one woman. It's okay to laugh there because I always do when I read that story. One woman, son, chases him all the way out in the middle of the desert. You know what he does? God takes care of him, has pity on him. Tree grows up over his head, gives him water. And Elijah's still having a pity party and whining, and he looks down in the valley, and he's like, God, I'm the only one doing anything, and you got this crazy woman chasing me. And you know what God said? God said, hush up. 7,000 people down there are worshiping me, not false gods. Hush up. So as we talk about meekness today, listen up. It's not all about you. God doesn't have to use you. He wants to use you. Okay, that was free. I didn't plan on saying that. <laughs> Philippians 2. Christ is our example of humility, meekness, being gentle. Look at verse 1. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind, doing nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. But in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Look at your neighbor and say, you're, you're more significant than me. Look at him. Did that pain some of you? Probably those who are married, it pained them really. Look at verse 4. Let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. Now, now let me say this, verse 3, verse 4, and here on, this is meekness. Okay? It's emptying yourself. But also in the interest of others, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Again, all of these beatitudes, what we're talking about today with meekness, being gentle in spirit, and we're going to talk deeper about it in a second as well. But being meek is a mindset. It's a mindset. So look, verse 5, having this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. Now what did Jesus do to be a perfect example of meekness? Well, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but look what he did. Verse 7, underline this. We'll write it down on your sheet of paper. But he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. Wait a minute. Jesus Christ became a servant? Yes, he did. Really, right here, we could stop, have the altar call. We could have the musicians come back and start singing. You know why? Because this is the message. If Jesus Christ himself was a servant, what's our problem? Say it louder for those in the back. Joan. Attitude. Attitude. 
emptied himself, verse 7. What did he do? How did he? By being a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form. He did what? He, whoa, he humbled himself. How was he obedient? Because he went to the cross. Let me tell you something today. You better be thankful that Jesus was meek. The King of kings, Lord of lords, creator of the universe, get a, get a load of this, died for you. I mean, seriously. So then what did God do with Jesus? Did he keep him low? He said no. He exalted him. You read here in verse number 9. He exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So meekness has a reward. And the reward we have in the beatitude is that we shall inherit the earth. We'll talk more about that in a second. But look what's going to happen. At this name, every knee one day is going to bow. Well, I can't kneel, preacher. My knees are bad. You're going to have good knees then. <laughs> new heaven, new earth. We're about to talk about that here in just a second. But can we say Jesus' name three, three times? Can we do that on three? One, two, three. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. 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 Now, let's all say it again. Three times. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Never gets old. It's a powerful name. And one day, did you catch that? Every knee. Every knee. You're not going to get away from it. Every knee's going to bow before Jesus. But first, he was made low. And then God exalted him. Same goes for you and I as Christ followers. If we deny him here, he's going to deny us there. I said earlier, Christians, we are not called to blend in with this culture. We are t called to stand out in the culture in which we live. If we were to call your closest friend that you have up to the platform and give a testimony of your life, would they say you are a Christian or not? Would your closest group of friends say, oh yes, they know Jesus Christ? Or would they walk up here and be like, I can't believe he's here today. Because when he's at work, boy, he acts just like the rest of us. She acts just like the rest of us. Got to be different. So meekness. Jesus is the example. But meekness is not weakness. And I want to show you that here this morning as we go back to Matthew chapter 5 and We'll finish out our time here. And yes. Meekness this morning, I want you to know, is like a cord with three strands of meaning coming together. So let's learn here. The first strand that makes up the meaning of meekness is strength under control or authority. Put it this way, meekness is power under control. Remember we said Jesus was the great example. I just read in Philippians chapter 2 about that great example, and we know that Jesus Christ came. One of the most telling passages in the Bible is that when Jesus was getting spat on and getting beaten, everybody look up here at me with your beautiful eyeballs. <laughs> Wake you up. Look at me. Here's what he did with his mouth. You see that? He kept it shut. When 
We know later all he had to do was call down legions of angels and he could have went back to glory. But he stayed quiet. He stayed gentle. Warren Wearsby says this, This word meek was used by the Greeks to describe a horse that had been broken. It refers to power under control. If you and I think about that for a minute, horse, horses are powerful creatures. Yet they have been brought under control by their owners so that they are useful creatures. Warren Wiersbe goes on to say that therefore when Jesus said blessed are the meek, he was referring to those who place themselves under God's authority and control as useful, obedient servants. One of the great other servant leaders that we see in the New Testament is in the book of James. James chapter 1 verse 1, you all know that's my favorite book outside the Gospels. And in James 1.1, 1, 1, here's what he says. James, a servant of Jesus Christ. Why is that important? Because James was the half-brother of Jesus. He could have said in James 1.1, 1, 1, James, the half-brother of Jesus. He could have boasted in and of himself, but instead of that, he said, no, I'm a servant. I am bound under the leadership and the authority of Jesus Christ. Let me ask you a question. What's driving your ship today? Who has the authority in your life? Is it self? Is it a sin? What's driving you? Man. Man. Meekness is power under control. You know what servants do of God? They follow his lead. It's not what you want anymore. It's what God wants. You know what else they do? They trust him. They go where he tells them to go. They do what he tells them to do. They do not run wild, even though the opportunity to run wild is there. I almost said something right there, but I won't. I will. I was driving down the road in Alaska, and up there, cannibalism is a big thing, and they have little dispensaries everywhere. What I learned in Alaska is that there are more dispensaries and coffee shops in Alaska than there are people. That's, I'm being honest. And a few of those folks in the van that we had, we had to keep from the dispensaries. We had to say, no, nope, no. Nope. I'm only kidding, church. <laughs> Sometimes you can say stuff and people's like, oh, well. I knew them people going. I knew them people. I knew them people going in that group. They was a raggedy old bunch, and I knew that's what they'd try to do. <laughs> but you know, we have the ability to run wild. All of us do. Sin's all around us. But being a servant follower of God is staying under his power and his control. So this first strand that we have, this first cord, if you will, is that as servants, we stay under the power and authority of God. Now, there's a second strand, and the second strand is gentleness. I've mentioned that word here a few times, gentleness, but this message of gentleness would have, it would have shocked this, uh, this original Jewish audience. And let me tell you something. The Gospel of Matthew, guess who it was written to? Directly to a Jewish audience. That's who he's writing to. That was his audience. And so... Jesus in his sermon, guess who he's talking to? Jewish followers there with him. And when, when he speaks of meekness, speaking of gentleness, they've been like, whoa, wait a minute. Because if you go on later in the sermon, he explains it a little bit more, and he explains it this way. Turn the other cheek. 
Don't you think when Peter heard this, he was like, whoop. Now, Jesus says, some things we fight for. James and John's over there going, now, Jesus put us right beside you. Remember, we're the good one. <laughs> Got to know your disciples. But it would have shocked them. Oh, and remember Jesus talks about going the second mile? Oh, remember Jesus goes on to talk about a little bit later, love your enemies? Meekness? So the second strand is being gentle. Let me tell you something. In a world that is out to stab you in the back, <laughs> what it needs to see is meekness. I don't think I need to harp on that much more. You get it? Say, we got it. Got it. I can go back if you want me to. But now, I will say this. Jesus does not call his followers to violence. Now, wait a minute, Pastor. I'm going to stand up for what's mine and what's mine and my family. You, I'm doing that. Let me tell you something. The world needs to see the love of Christ. I'm not standing here today telling you not to protect your family. But we as Christians are called to extend grace where it's needed. Let me ask you a question. Where would you be if grace hadn't been extended to you? Lost, L-O-S-T, lost. Okay. Jesus doesn't call us to violence but gentleness. Then the third strand, and this is how we're going to wrap it up. The third strand is Humility. Boom, boom, boom. You know what James chapter 4, verse 6 says? But he gives more grace. How many needs more grace? Huh? 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 <laughs> you all should raise both hands and say, Amen, hallelujah. I need more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Isaiah 66, the last part of that verse, verse 2. The last part of verse 2 says, But this is the one to whom I will look, he who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. Can I ask you a personal question? How many need God to look their way today? Hmm? Hmm? How many here want the hand of God on their life? then you need to listen to Isaiah 66, verse 2. Guess where he's going to look? Toward the one who's humble. Toward the one who's a servant. Who is bound to Jesus Christ and doing his will, not their own. And trembles at God's word. Now I'm almost done, so tune me in there. Ulrich Zwingli, one of the leaders of the Protestant Reformation, tells a time when he was struggling with pride in his personal life. He took a prayer walk up a nearby Swiss mountain. At one point, he noticed two mountain goats on the same narrow mountain trail headed towards one another. When they met, he wondered what would happen. There was no room to go around each other. He thought for a second that they might fight and one or both would die. He goes on to tell something surprising happened. The goat was headed up the mountain. The goat that was headed up the mountain, it laid down. And the goat that was headed down the mountain stepped over him. The lesson of the goats had a profound impact on this man. Here's what he writes. He learned that the goat was able to go higher because he was willing to go lower. What did he do? It shows us that he was foregoing worldly power. 
Remember what I said earlier? America today is all about success, and success is measured by what? Everybody look at me. Money. A big house. How new a car. It's also by beauty and looks. But God wants to use you. Thank goodness it ain't how I look. I walked out of the room one day in Alaska and I had on my suspenders. There's two folks that was leading us. They said, what? What are you doing wearing suspenders? I said, have you not seen this? <laughs> it keeps everything where it needs to be. God, don't look at our outward appearance, church. God's looking at your heart today. And he sees your heart today. What does he see? Is it a heart that boasts of what you yourself is doing? Or is it a heart that is promoting Christ Jesus? You say, well, that's all good and dandy. You talk about humility and how we are to live under his power and to serve him. But tell us about this promise. Oh, I'm going to. The promise is if we live with this humility and we live under his power and his control, guess what the promise is? <laughs> we get to live in a new kingdom. Brand spanking new. And man, I don't have time to unravel it. I see what time it is. Somebody's food's going to burn at home. So Revelation 21, verse 1, you can write it down. You can go home later and look at it. But what's going to happen one day, the Bible says in Revelation 21, a new heaven and a new earth is going to descend and suspend. Listen very closely to me now. This is some theology for you. A new heaven, new earth is going to descend but suspend above the current earth as we know it. And it's going to be a renovated, now get a, get a load of this. It's going to be a renovated version of what you see out there. You may think, well, how in the world can it get any better? Well, God created that. He created that. So submitting our life to the power of God... He says in verse 5, shall inherit the earth. The way, the number, the first step to coming to Christ is with humility. How do we come to Christ? David Carter gave a, gave a uh, testimony just a few minutes ago about salvation. How did he come when he was 11 years old? By humility. He recognized that he was a sinner. How did you, when you came to Christ, what was the step? Humility, you came and you realized that you needed a Savior. How many's done that? So in that kingdom, we receive by God's grace the good things that so many down here arrogantly with arrogance, fruitlessly strive for in the present earth. What are people striving for? What I mentioned earlier, success, fame, fortune. Th that's what they're striving for. Who's here and will say, I'm just trying to make it? <laughs> I'm just trying to get through, through a Sunday. I'm getting through it with a little bit of coffee and a whole lot of Jesus. There's people here, though, you're dreading tomorrow, you're dreading Tuesday, or you're dreading a Wednesday. But let me tell you something. <laughs> My God will supply all your needs according to his riches in glory when we submit to his power and we fall under his leadership and we live with humility and we live understanding greater is he than me.
plain and simple. So let's all stand to our feet. JC, are you doing the invitation? If you will, come right on back. I know folks have already came down to the altar. Hey, maybe you'd like to come again. JC's going to come. Dana's going to come and sing. Simple invitation this morning. Here's how we respond. Will we give our life to him today and say, God, trust you. I trust you. I trust you. I'm just going to trust you. Greater are you than me. That's the invitation today. All right? As they sing. Who wants to come? Put your life in his hands and trust him.
All righty, just real quick, let me run through some announcements. We've got several things here. We'll, we will not be having evening services tonight because a lot of people's dead. Uh, <laughs> so we're going to be resting up. Uh, I want to say thank you for praying for the Alaska Mission team. July the 9th at 6 o'clock, that's a Sunday night, where the Alaska Mission team is going to be sharing with the church. Please don't miss that. Um, circle that on your calendar, please. Um, Wednesday, June the 28th, that's this coming Wednesday, we'll get back on schedule. 6.30, we'll have prayer and devotion right here in the main sanctuary, so please uh, come be a part of that. Now, next Saturday, July the 2nd, at 4.30, we're going to be having a cookout here at the church, not down on the field. It'll be right up here in the fellowship hall. And then there's going to be a singing at 6.30. And Fields of Grace and the Metcalf sisters are going to be singing in the sanctuary. So please, if you can, come out to that. We'd love to have you. If you have any suggestions for the Building and Grounds Committee, please Put it in the brown box that's located in the main foyer of the church. Write it on a sheet of paper, stick it in there. It's checked weekly, and they'll see what they can do. Please remember to pray for Randy and Christy. Christy's dad passed away this past week. We've put on here the arrangements on your announcements, but if you can, make sure you definitely get by and, and speak to them here today. But we'll be praying for them in the coming coming days but the, the best part is he's in heaven today Amen. and has no more pain I mean that's that's what we're looking forward to all right everybody some I've had people ask okay funerals it for the dead the living the funerals for the living because when they have that funeral he's not there anymore it's for us that's left. I see funerals all the time. They, it's great. We'll, we'll say a few things about the person that lived, but let me tell you something. They're not hurting anymore. <laughs> they in heaven. How many believe in heaven? Oh, thank you. Good. Good. A little concerned. All right. Listen, have a good day. Have a good afternoon. Enjoy your families. Rest up if you need rest it up. Wednesday, 6.30. Okay? Okay. Billy, will you pray and dismiss us, buddy?